this time on a very special hack five. DEFCON 21 and Pineapple. This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Coming to you from DEFCON 21, I'm Darren Kitchen here with Sean Malone. Sean, how are you? I'm doing great. It's another great year here. So you're here with Fusion X talking about Hivemind. Walk me through Hivemind. What's the general overview? So the problem that we're trying to solve is sometimes you have sensitive data that you want to store. You need a way to store it reliably, but you need to make sure it doesn't fall into the wrong hands. And that sensitive data, you might say, well, let's just encrypt it. But as we've seen from various cases in the news, a court order or a $5 wrench can be enough to force you to decrypt that data. So what we want to do is store it in a way such that if your server sees, the data is simply not there. And so how do you get the data on the server? You just put it on another server, right? I mean, data has to live somewhere. Right, it definitely has to live somewhere. So at first you might say, well, let's just store it on somebody else's system. And the problem is that usually that's illegal. It's nice to be able to do this in a way that's at least mostly legal. So we do that through the use of a JavaScript botnet. So this is a botnet where the nodes in the botnet are actually web browsers. So you take control of a browser through the use of JavaScript via any number of, a, of different techniques, such as um, anonymous proxy servers that modify the traffic as it passes through, sites that you control, persistent cross-site scripting. Any of these ways will let us actually take control of a node and add it to the botnet. And then we use that to build a distributed file system on top of that JavaScript botnet. Okay, so it's not your traditional botnet where it's like, I just pwned your machine, I'm going to do a command and control over IRC or something. It's, you just visited my website, and since you're running a modern browser that supports HTML5 and Java and all, uh, JavaScript and all of those things, you don't, you're not even pushing like a, like a payload to them. It's just it's a natural behavior. That's absolutely right. That's the, the real beauty of this setup is that we're exploiting features, not bugs. There's nothing here to patch. This is all part of, like you mentioned, the HTML5 features. We take advantage of particularly web storage for storing the data and web sockets in order to establish that persistent command and control channel. And these features, there are many legitimate uses, but they could have been written for botnets. That's how applicable they are to exactly what we need to do for command and control and data storage. So because these are features and not bugs, there's nothing to patch, and removing these features would break a lot of legitimate web applications. So give me an idea of how this feature is used in legitimate web applications. So for, for web storage, you may have preferences that an anonymous user, so, so you don't have a, a back end where they've logged in with the username and password, so you're not storing anything on the back end, but you still want the user to be able to set some preferences. When they set those preferences, the configuration based on those preferences would likely be stored in local storage on the browser. So when the user then goes back to the site, the data's, the, the configuration preferences, it's pulled out of local storage and used to configure the site on the fly there. So that would be a legitimate use for the, the local storage. And that is very different than, you know, before the, the new web, before HTML5 and all of that, everybody just used cookies, right? Right, right. Uh, local storage is sort of cookies on steroids. More data, some interesting features. Uh, it's, it's basically a standard key value data store now, but the specification says that users may want to store, or applications may want to store up to megabytes of user data. Megabytes. Right, megabytes. And I look at that and I say, if the browser is willing to store megabytes of application data, why not I use that to put megabytes of my own data in there through this JavaScript botnet? So what you're saying is, so give me an idea of the megabytes that different browsers, modern browsers, will store for you. So it's usually five megabytes on most browsers. So your, your storage per node is going to be limited to roughly five megabytes, but imagine putting a hidden iframe in a popular site via a persistent cross-site scripting attack, for example. All of a sudden, you've got a million different nodes that are all connecting to the site, uh, and each, each node then has five megabytes. That's a very large amount of data storage there. Okay, so walk me through this. If, say, I have a quarter million people unique a month going to hack5.org, a site I already control, how do I set this up? And what kind of, um, what kind of storage capabilities would that give me? So the key feature here is that it's not so much total per month, but total online at any given time. Because this is an extremely transient botnet. So it really has to be concurrent connections. Right, it needs to be concurrent. Because as soon as a user 
navigates away from the site, you lose that command and control channel and you can no longer retrieve that data. Why, why is that? So the five megs that they're holding is only only for me, uh, you know, I can only communicate with them while they're on my website? What about when they leave and come back later? So they may come back online, they may present that data as still there, um, but you may not want that. You may want to have a piece of JavaScript so that right when they're leaving the site, it actually wipes that just for additional security. But because of that very transient nature, uh, HiveMind does have the capability, and it's sort of one of the key features there, to do a constant heartbeat on all of the nodes. And so when a node drops offline that contains a particular file block, it quickly replicates that to new nodes. So when you first do that initial upload, you may distribute across 10 different nodes, and that heartbeat says when it drops down below five nodes containing the same block, then you replicate across a new 10. So as long as you have enough people who are visiting the site, even when those people go offline, the data continues to persist since it's very quickly being replicated to the active nodes. So if I was trying to securely hide 100 megabytes of stuff, I would need at least 10 people on my website, at any, or 20 people on my website at any given time. And well, really, I would want more because they'd need to be able to replicate. And they can only replicate, they can't replicate with each other, right? Correct. It all has to go through the server. So the server is going to be your single point of failure there, which is something that you absolutely want in this case. So the reason that you want that is if and when that server is ever seized, then the, the nodes can no longer talk to the server and the block replication fails. Those blocks become unrecoverable and you can no longer rebuild the file from the blocks and be able to download it. So there's very li little data that actually persists on the server. You can think of the server as a phone book for the data, but it doesn't actually have the file data itself. That's all out on the node. That's amazing. The data is just out at sea. You seize the server, and suddenly the data no longer exists. So for any forensics investigator, how Okay, now, okay, let's play white hat here. I'm a forensics investigator. I'm targeting you because you're using this cool hive mind stuff, and I don't know, maybe there's something interesting in there I want to see. Can I just go to your website 20 times and get it? So there would be three different ways that this could be uh, defeated. The first is, like you mentioned, putting your own nodes in the botnet. Uh, if you hit a certain critical mass, a certain critical percentage, and log all of those blocks, you are going to be able to rebuild that file later. So we do have an encryption layer as well, so you'd have to get all of the blocks and get that key. As I mentioned earlier, there's some limits to how useful encryption can be in certain cases, but it's there as an extra step. The other two ways, uh, first would be if you actually compromise the server itself, so compromise the server while it's online, log that block data as it goes through, or log the file after it's been uh, compiled and decrypted, but before it's downloaded. So you could intercept the file there, but it requires compromising the server while it's online. And the final method would be to simply go out and seize all of the nodes based on ISP logs. But you're talking about seizing thousands or millions of private computers at that point, and you've increased the complexity by at least an order of magnitude. Good luck, man. I love this. In the game of cat and mouse, this is a really interesting mouse. Or cat, depends on the way you look at it. Right, right. And the data recovery is always going to be theoretically possible. The idea here is to make it as difficult as possible. So it's obfuscation, but it's really interesting because it's ephemeral and it's never on your machine. Uh, it, it's only on the machine temporarily. It has to go through the central server initially, since that is the single point. But that's, it's one block at a time. Right, right. It's usually one block at a time. Um, the only exception is when you initially store the file and then when you pull it back down. That is so great. So you could potentially lose your data. Um, so I, well, I'm trying to think of a use case here for this, but I'm sure people can come up with something interesting. Uh, is there any way to allow, say, the clients that are nodes on this this network, uh, this botnet of storage, to also have access to that file? Or I guess they all have to go through the central storage. So it's not like, not like you could use this for a file sharing network. So you could use this for a file sharing network, and the way that would work is you, instead of allowing the nodes only access to store and send blocks back to the server, you also allow them to access more of that management interface where they can upload their own file. And so at that point, you can, you can look at this as a cooperative distributed file system where I add my browser, you add your browser, and when I upload a file or you upload a file, it's broken into blocks and it's stored across both of our browsers. So we all keep different pieces. And so long as this replication occurs, that data is going to be accessible. But if any one of our systems gets seized, 
the data is not actually going to be there on that system. Which is what you want. Right, and it's not going to be on the server either. So you can seize my system, you can seize the server that you see I'm connected to, but you actually have to seize a certain critical mass of all of these other nodes as well, since it's very distributed. If only there were a system that man in the middle attacked every node on the internet and stored it in Utah. <laughs> so, and we actually use uh, one of the, we, we use a version of that in order to build the botnet. We use an open anonymous proxy server. Stand it up out there on the internet, we don't even need to advertise it. It gets hit. Uh, the last metric that I saw when I logged in there was that unsolicited, it's getting hit with 20,000 unique IPs in 10 minutes. And so what we do is simply modify the traffic that goes through there uh, and say replace the ending body tag with a hidden iframe and then the body tag. And that iframe adds that node to the botnet. So it's like, oh, you were looking for Facebook? Well, here's Facebook and a little something extra just for you. Absolutely. And it's, it's interesting from a legal perspective as well, because since it was completely unsolicited, we're not asking you to connect to the server. We're not promising anything about what we're going to provide here. You're choosing to send data through this proxy server, and we're providing whatever we want. It happens to look similar to the data that you were requesting from my private server, but it's my private server, and I can provide whatever I want in addition to that. Oh, man, I want to put this on the pineapple. Okay, so the um, so uh, speaking of the interesting legal thing is, considering this is just a feature of HTML5, it doesn't even prompt you and say, this website wants to add five megabytes to your hard drive. Would you like that? It only prompts you if you go below, or sorry, if you go above that initial limit. So long as you stay below the default limit, there's no prompt at all. It's entirely in the background. Does this, and I'm not sure if this has been patched, but last year there was a lot of talk about, uh, what was it, fillmyharddrive.com had set up a bunch of subdomains. It was like one.fillmyharddrive.com, two.fillmyharddrive.com. You'd go to that, and it would give you five megabytes, five megabytes, five megabytes, until it's blue in the face and your disk is no longer spinning. Um, could you use that kind of to your advantage to increase the space? You can absolutely use that sort of attack or any other bug that's identified in the future that allows you to um, use multiple domains or or even uh, th so that one was multiple subdomains. You could do the same thing here with multiple domains uh, because that that's a feature at that point where you want each domain to have their own partition that's not dependent on how full other sites' storage is. So if you register a hundred domains and you're using all of those domains for this botnet, all of a sudden you've increased that per uh, per node storage from five megabytes to five hundred megabytes. Okay, so how do I start using this on, like, say, hack5.org? What do I need to download? What do I need to run to, I don't know, start putting out the darknet stuff on there? So I am going to be releasing the source code for HiveMind. It is basically a Ruby on Rails application with a combination MySQL and Redis backend. Uh, it's got the, the main application there as well as the, the socket that accepts the, the incoming web sockets. So it's very easy to spin up on your own server. I use Ubuntu Server, but you could run this on anything that supports Ruby on Rails. The code is going to be released on GitHub. The easiest way to find it is simply through my personal website where I'll be linking to the code, and I'll have the slides from my presentation that I'm giving tomorrow up there as well. And that personal site is www.seantmalone.com. That's S-E-A-N-T-M-A-L-O-N-E.com. Dude, Sean, that is fascinating. I love this stuff. Thank you so much for spending some time with us here on Hack5. Really appreciate it, and uh, best of luck to you and your uh, distributed, uh, distributed botnet file system. That's fantastic. All right, thank you very much. I want to take a quick moment to tell you guys about the .NET. This thing is globally known. It's one of the most popular top-level domains, and it instantly injects credibility into whatever your project may be. So if you already have a .com, go ahead and protect your brand by getting that .NET to go along with it. We did that for Hack Across America. I did that on Darren Kitchen. And listen, if you want to register uh, a domain and you don't want to have to get some insanely long .com because what you want is already taken, a .NET is a great alternative. And get this, they're just $8.99 a year over at domain.com but get this we have the special hookup because domain.com are huge hack five fans they're fans of you guys so they're getting you 15 percent off their already affordable domain names and web hosting all you have to do is use the coupon code hack five at domain.com's checkout that's 15 percent off and big savings to, oh, don't forget to use that coupon code hak5 when you think domain names think domain.com